Hey friends, welcome to Boca, a podcast exploring the ever blurring lines between the personal and business lives of professional photographers. This is your host, Nathan Holritz, and I'm happy that you can join me today in connecting with photographers and entrepreneurs as we discuss photography, business, and oh yeah, that sometimes messy thing that we call life. This podcast is brought to you by Photographer's Edit, custom image editing for the wedding and portrait photographer. Just visit photographersedit.com. All right, Boca Podcast listeners, thanks so much for joining us for yet another episode here at the Boca Podcast. And I'm here with a new friend of mine, Kian Lamb. Thank you so much, Kian, for making time for the Boca Podcast listeners. Yeah, happy to be here. Well, and and I have to say, first of all, I, I'm, I've got your Instagram account pulled up here and then uh, also your website. You know, I'm amazed sometimes at what our pop, what our kind of pop culture, modern pop culture, particularly in the U.S., finds interesting and who gets the following and who gets the accolades and who gets the fame. But I spent some time looking through your website today and, and video footage and, of course, your Instagram account as well. And I'm just the big question mark in my mind is how do more people not know about what you're doing? Because your story <laughs> is fascinating. Certainly one of the most interesting people we've had in the podcast yet. And so we're going to kind of dig into that in just a little bit. I don't like to usually go about the the traditional bi- uh, biographical introduction, if you will, but you had a, a clip on your website, uh, a little blurb that was really interesting to me. And I'd love for you to kind of comment on this, but it says, the short answer is that I'm a photographer and filmmaker. I'm a visual storyteller in constant search of new adventures. When I see or learn about something cool, I add it to my bucket list. Then I do my best to check off as many of those items. The longer answer has to do a little more with realizing how precious time is and learning unceasingly how to make the most from what I was given. So I, I kind of want to explore this a little bit. You know, a lot of people talk about the idea of living out loud and living life to the fullest. You are literally doing just that that thing. But what drives that? What is motivating that? I think for me, you know, I'm obsessed with the idea of time. Okay. I mean, everything, whether it's my interest or what I do and all that, like it still somehow revolves around the idea of time and how, you know, we have in some ways a lot of it. And then at the same time, like none of it, you know, I was working, you know, growing up, wanted to do well in school so that I'd get a good job, make good money, help my parents out, do all that jazz. And I I did that, you know, made it to a really good university, got my six figure job. And then as soon as I started doing that, I realized, oh, man, I've got the money, but I don't have the time to do anything I want to do. And yeah, in 2010, that sort of came to a head and, you know, it was a choice between taking a promotion, continuing on this kind of path and then being locked in even further with golden handcuffs. So they, um, they say, or to kind of quit and just figure something else out. And so I did that knowing that by quitting, I now had time. And then it's just about figuring out what to do with that time. (laughs) <laughs> and it sounds so simple and, and beautiful at the same time. And I want to dig into this a little bit more because I'm fascinated by psychology in general. But you know, when we talk about living out loud again or having this, this big bucket list, and you actually have multiple bucket lists. I want to ask you about that in a second. But this idea of actually getting accomplishing big things for your life it takes a certain amount of motivation. And, you know, I mean, for that matter, small goals even take a certain motivation, understanding what motivates us and setting ourselves up in that way for success. That that can be complicated for a lot of people. What is, you mentioned earlier, time is a motivating factor. Why is time a motivating factor? Where does that come from? You know, when you look at it, right, like your whole life is kind of like a big story with a bunch of chapters. Yeah. And you know, you think about, oh, wow, time flies so fast. What did you do with the past like year? You know, where did 2018 go? You know, and for that matter, where did 2017, the past five years, the past 10 years? And if you, you know, talk to people and they're just like, oh man, yeah, time flies. I don't know what I did. And for me, you know, I don't want that to be the answer. You know, I want to look back and be like, yeah, time flew, but oh yeah, this is what I did. Like, this is where I spent this month or this is what I did the last two months. And, you know, when I look at it that way, then you're like, okay, you're making the most of it. You don't want to just kind of see life flash by really and look back and be like, oh, I wish I'd done this. I wish I'd done that. So 
with that in mind and you know it has been in mind for the past five six ten years i don't know i just want to make the most of every day so whether it's like you know accomplishing a big thing on the bucket list or you know doing something small like oh you know there's something i want to try some food group that i haven't eaten uh and if i happen to be able to do that today that's great and if there's like a bigger item like uh, actually i was in london the other day and i was hoping to go wing walking uh, it didn't work out, but that would have been a nice little random big bucket list item uh, to, <laughs> to stand say on the top least. of the wing. You know? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I, there's there's something uh, there's a principle that uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan of a guy named Tony Robbins, and one of the things that he talks about is the significance of pain and pleasure in our lives, and how that ultimately drives our belief system. And I, I'm noticing, based on what you're describing here, I mean that that maybe the so-called pain or frustration that you were experiencing had to do with being stuck in this maybe almost monotonous existence in the corporate world uh, and the so-called happiness or pleasure that you're reaching for now because of that that pain experience has to do with being able to get out from behind the, the desk maybe literally and figuratively and have the freedom the flexibility to be able to actually take advantage of the opportunities that life gives you would you say that that is largely accurate what was that experience transitioning from corporate to being able to have all of this time, the flexibility to be able to go explore the world like you do. Yeah, no, I think that statement is accurate. You know, for the most part, you know, if you look at my story, yeah, corporate before and then sort of doing something completely different now, it fits into that mode. But uh, actually, when I was doing my uh, job in finance, I liked it. You know, I woke up and I went to work and I enjoyed the work I was doing. I enjoyed the people I was working with. For me, personally, it was just it was a little bit constraining that I had to come into work, you know, five days a week and exactly at this time. And I leave roughly at the same time every day. Yeah. Transitioning was like a, a huge thing, you know, just to go from having to do something every day to like, wow, where do I get to go today? Yeah. For the most part, I think, you know, most people would agree with that if they ever get the chance to do it. Um, but at the same time, where I was going with this is that, you know, what, even with that job, it wasn't about like, you know, being trapped or anything. As long as, you know, you're enjoying what you do, that's sort of what matters. That's interesting. But yet you saw, you still saw an opportunity to be able to experience life in a different way. And so you, you stepped away from that. You said back in 2010 and now for the last eight years or so, you are, I mean, you're literally crossing items off your bucket list. Uh, and for those of you listening in, if you haven't been to Ken's website yet, uh, very simply, it is whereandwander.com. And we'll, we'll link to this in the show notes. Uh, you can also find him on Instagram at hello, Kien, K-I-E-N, uh, as well. And, and the imagery there is just stunning. I mean, it, again, it's one thing to to... to say that you want to live out loud, your your images indicate the fact that you're actually doing that. And I find it really, really fascinating. Um, and, and by the way, for those of you listening in as well, you're probably thinking, you're not asking, Nate, you're not asking the same questions that you do uh, with most of your guests. I literally scrapped my standard outline of questions today for the sake of this conversation, because it just seemed like we needed to go a whole different direction. But I love that we've started off with a focus on time, uh, because much of what we talk about here on the podcast has to do with creating more freedom, more flexibility for photography business owners. It's easy to get stuck behind the computer, miss out on the opportunity to, to experience life. And uh, I love that you're exemplifying that mentality, Keen. And, and to that point, I'm, I'm really curious because, uh, again, it's easy to create a bucket list or in your case, multiple bucket lists. Uh, it's another thing to actually follow through and cross those items off a bucket list. And I'm, I wonder if there's a way that you approach this that enables you to consistently cross things off. You know, I, if you set a big goal, it can look overwhelming and then you never really get to it. How do you actually make this stuff happen? So for my bucket list and for any bucket list, I sort of recommend having real big items on there, like go to space or, you know, have a million dollars in your bank account and to kind of alongside that have a bunch of smaller items. Hmm, okay. And that's because this, I mean, it's, you know, unless you are super rich or just super connected or super, super motivated, it's very hard to check off these big ticketed items every day or every week. I mean, some people do. So <laughs> I, I wish I could do that, but there's some days where 
um, you know, it could be a small thing. I have on there, like, uh, if I can remember correctly, like leave a, a meaningful 100% tip. And that's just, you know, like if you have go out and you have a meal and, you know, somebody was just awesome or, you know, whatever. And it could be a $20 meal or $50, $100 meal, whatever it is. And you're just like, you know what, I, I just want to do something nice. Yeah. Um, nobody needs to know about it. You know, like I don't need to write a post about it, you know, but I want to do something nice. And it's something that I could theoretically do every day until I run out, out of money. And so it could be smaller things like that. It could be to just hug a random stranger. You know, hopefully they, you know, it's not a me too thing. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I don't want to make but, anybody too uncomfortable, but no, I, I get it. There, There is, well, you've actually separated and I'm actually on the, the page now where you have your bucket list items. For those of you listening in, again, if you just go to whereandwander.com, uh, there's a section there called bucket list and you, you've separated the bucket lists into different sections. You've got a classic bucket list with some really big ticket items on there. Um, and then the adventure bucket list. And then you also have the hidden gems bucket list and then the indulgent bucket list. Uh, and then even something like the random bucket list and, and on the random one is like raisin Amish barn or stomp grapes in Italy. <laughs> but yeah. at the end of the day, to be able to also add to those items, something that, you know, will be impactful to others is, is huge too. And, and I love that you put some priority on that. Uh, I, I have to, I have to list some of these for those listening in because it's, it's pretty incredible. Like, you know, enjoy flamenco and Andalusia is, is one of the ones that you cr- crossed off of your indulgent bucket list. Uh, walk in Laval de la Luna. Uh, is one that you had on the Hidden Gems bucket list, or Dive the Red Sea is on your adventure bucket list, or Fly in a Seaplane on your classic bucket list. But you all make sure you go and check check out this particular page because you're going to find a lot of inspiration in it. Again, kudos to you, Kian, for, for actually making these happen. And you mentioned the significance of having big items and small items, but do you like, and maybe this is a little too nerdy, but do you take one of those items and break it down into multiple, multiple steps to try to figure out how you can accomplish that? What are, what are the steps towards reaching those items on the bucket list? Yeah, I think, I mean, I don't have like one methodical approach to checking these things off. Some of it is opportunistic. The thing that I have to remind myself is, you know, if I have a lot of items on there that are international, then I have to keep traveling. So then, yeah, if you want to break it down, it's like, how do I keep traveling? One, well, I have to find a way to make money. And (laughs) two, I need to dedicate the time to it. It's one thing to find the time. It's another to dedicate the time to it. Mm. Because with, you know, sort of your entire year left wide open, for me, it's, you know, I'll have clients that will book me in advance. So I'll sort of know when uh, I have projects. And then there are projects that are just kind of booked as people know I'll be in a region. And then the rest of the time, it really is open. So I could just stay at home and, you know, go to the gym every day and, you know, just work out, train or whatever. Or I can say, okay, you know what, it's time to book uh, a ticket and start planning. And you're constantly having to, to think about what you want to do with tomorrow. And for me, I don't necessarily think, oh, man, you know, this year, I need to do this one particular item. You know, I've put this big bucket list together so that wherever I go, there can be things that will remind me to to kind of do this kind of living out loud, yes. this live life to the fullest. Yeah. And yeah, once you're on the road, I'm like, okay, so the wing walking thing, I actually think I may have accidentally taken it off this, but or I might have taken it off because I wasn't sure that people actually still did that Uh, (laughs) but yeah just uh the other day i was in madrid doing a shoot and something popped up on facebook and it was swing walking and then it said it was in the uk and i thought oh man i'm going to london where is this place and turns out it was like an hour's drive away wow so as soon as i got to london i started emailing them and of course i mean this story did not end its success I just ran out of time on this trip. Sure. Yeah, that could have been an item where, you know, randomly it popped off, popped up on the screen and I was in the right place at roughly the right time to do it. And then it was just a matter of saying, this is what I want to do today. I'm going to set this time aside. I'm going to reach out to these people and see if logistically we can make it happen in the time I have. 
That makes sense. Well, and I think a lot of it does start with there is something significant to having a list to begin with because it keeps front of mind what you actually want to accomplish. I mean, this is true. We, we talk a lot on, on the podcast about the idea of having a big picture view is what I refer to it as, but basically long-term personal goals that then drive the business model, which drives, the, of course, the target client, the price points that you charge, et cetera, the, the amount that you even shoot in a year. But it's this big picture view that's driving it. You've got this bucket list that helps kind of drive how you spend your time. And it's nice to, and not even just nice, it's important for, especially for those listening in, to, to establish whether it's a, you call it a bucket list or a big picture view or otherwise, if you want to live life to the full, it's, it's important to start first with some goals that are front of mind that you're constantly, consistently looking at. And then you're looking, as Ken has done, looking for opportunities to be able to fulfill those. And again, I think it's a great example that you set for us. What would you say are the top two or three most exhilarating adventures that you've experienced thus far? A couple of years, two or three years ago, uh, I went to Palau and this one had long been on my bucket list and it was to free dive with the million jellyfish and you may or may not have seen it pop up online social media from time to time but there's this lake in um, the island of palau which is roughly between um, a few hours between japan and philippines and guam okay it's just out in the middle of nowhere beautiful set of uh, rock islands and there's this sort of enclosed lake and there's millions of jellyfish in there and because they've been there for so long, they've lost the sort of need ability to sting. So people can actually go down there and swim amongst like, just like a swarming amount of jellyfish. Oh, wow. Without getting killed. And yeah, I, I made it out there. You know, you jump into this lake and it just looks like any other lake and you're just kind of snorkeling along. And then eventually if you kind of are swimming in the right direction, you'll see one jellyfish pop up and then you'll see like five. And then, you know, you kind of look a little bit to the left and you follow or to the right and you're following sort of where they're migrating to. Then you see 50, then hundreds. And then before you realize it, it's just, it's everywhere. And then from there, I actually made the mistake of like grabbing a, a new mask right before I left and it, I forgot my snorkel. So when I got there, it was just, you know, come up for air, <clears throat> breathe, slow down my heart rate, yeah. and then just dive down and go as long and as far as I can. And I, yeah, I went down there with my two cameras to film it. And I stayed down for, you know, 30 seconds to a minute and a half at a time. Wow. Got down to roughly 40 feet. Anything lower than that, they don't recommend because there's like layer of poisonous gas down there. But anyhow, uh, just being surrounded by millions of jellyfish, it was surreal. I was that was actually the exact word that that popped into my head. I mean, that had to had to have been extremely surreal, almost like something you'd see on Avatar or something. This this floating mass of semi transparent beings. I mean, it, it sounds absolutely beautiful and what an incredible opportunity. I noticed that you did go skydiving. Was that something that you did recently? skydiving oh, that was actually uh, over 10 years ago really yeah. okay what what was, was the having, impetus for that i was having lunch uh with a friend in sacramento and we said let's go skydiving and she said there's a place 40 minutes from here and that was it and you lit did you just go that day or did you like next day was it right away no, no, it was right away. We just, we paid for lunch and then we went skydiving. <laughs> yeah. Man, that's a, that's a beautiful example of just going for it. I mean, and, and the list of things that you've done is, is really incredible. I mean, everything from, from meeting the Dalai Lama to swimming with whale sharks, uh, that was that's some beautiful imagery from that particular experience. I mean, and, and the list really does go on. Uh, Road to Death, this is another uh, article or blog post on your website, the 12-hour hurricane heat. Um, this is a multi-part series, of, you said, about the, the 2015 peak races. What, what is that? Because the, the picture actually shows you jumping over flames. Yeah, so this is sort of a part of a series of endurance races that I do from time to time. started with doing uh, the mud races like Spartan... And Tough Mudder, if you've heard of those. For sure. And, you know, within this, there's sort of a niche group that takes it a little bit further. Uh, they do more like group oriented or some are individual, but it goes four hours. 
uh, instead of like a typical mile based race. And then some go 12 hours and then they go to like 30 something hours. And then there are races like the death race that go as long as three days. So as you're doing it, and these are, to kind of clarify, these are races where you kind of just show up okay. with a gear list that they provide. And then you have no idea what you're expected to do for the duration of the race. It oh, can wow. be anything from, you know, like as simple as like, okay, just run from this point to this point, And it'd be like a 20 mile run, or it could be something like, okay, well, you've got to get from this point to this point, but you need to fill up this five gallon bucket with water and carry it on your back while doing that. Uh, you can be chopping wood for eight hours, you know, in one race I was actually tied to nine other people hiking for, I think 18 hours and 20 something miles with no shoes on. Oh and- my word no clothes. They told us to just strip down to our underwear, yeah. take out a rope. You know, you just had to tie it around our life jackets tied to nine other people. And then, uh, we just kept hiking barefoot through the mountain for a long time. And that's, so, that's the, I mean, that's the race. I've never even heard of anything like that before. That's so bizarre. Yeah. It's, uh, it's one of those things where, you know, people think you're crazy for doing it. And obviously they ask why you do something like this, yeah. uh, especially races that last for multiple days and you don't get sleep and your feet's hurting, you lose toenails and things like that. And part of it is just to short answer is just to see what you're capable of. Yeah. You know, how far you can push yourself mentally, physically, psychologically. And the goal of the race director is to push you in a way where they want you to quit. They want you to break. And your job is to not th- let them get you. That's <laughs> it's as simple as that. So that's that's interesting, though. It sounds very similar. I had the opportunity a few years ago to race triathlon, and to your point about learning what your body is capable of and, and learning how to push yourself through uncomfort. I think I think we can all stand to have those experiences for the sake of personal growth, psychological growth. Uh, I think it's really important for us to have those experiences, but then. I don't know. You know, there's there's a tendency for most of us to just kind of function in our comfort zone. And there's something to be said for having experiences that that we that we go for, despite the fact that we know that we're afraid of them. I mean, for me, I've been skydiving a couple of times now, and I have a, a deathly of, a fear of of heights. But it it made sense to go after that fear and to confront it. Um, I noticed that you actually mentioned in, in your article about skydiving that when you're up at 10,000 feet, you're almost not afraid of heights because you don't get the sense that you can actually fall off and, and fall 10,000 feet. It's a whole different perspective. Um, yeah. But but regardless, going for something like that, that challenges logic almost, um, I think it's something that we need to do from time to time to really feel. I mean, I, I literally had a, a physical buzz for about 45 minutes when I landed after that first jump. It was just, oh, yeah. I mean, you feel like you can own the world. And that's not something that somebody sitting at home watching Netflix can, can have. You know, it's not an experience that, that they will be able to relate to. So it doesn't mean that everybody has to jump out of a plane, but I'd highly recommend those listening in. Do something that scares you a little bit. Um, it, it'll, it'll make a big impact on not only how you feel as an individual about yourself, but it also makes a big impact on your perspective, how you see the world. Uh, and spe- speaking of perspective and heights, I noticed that you went and flew a stunt plane. What was that about? Uh, yeah, so I was driving through New Zealand and, uh, I wanted to make a video where I just basically did every, I mean, New Zealand is known for their adrenaline based activities. So bungee jumping, canyon swings, like these jet boats that, you know, hug the cliff from like within inches, you know, going 60, 70 miles an hour type of thing. And so I just wanted to experience all of that. And, um, but I hadn't heard about the stunt plane thing. We drove up to Abel Tasman and that morning my friend wanted to go skydiving and I just wanted to sleep because I'd already gone skydiving. (laughs) And then, so we drove to the airport at the, the airfield where the skydiving was. And, um, I had emailed, you know, this company about, uh, their stunt plane thing. And, you know, I completely forgot about it, but apparently where I parked was right next to, to where their base of operations was. So they kind of looked out the window and saw my email at the same time and be like, <laughs> they're like, oh, are you still in New Zealand? Uh, do you still want to fly? We've got an opening. And, uh, 
at that time I'd woken up and driven to eat lunch. And then my thought process and, you know, like I was almost ashamed to say this, but I was like too lazy at the time to, to want to drive 20 minutes back to the air. Sure. sure. Yeah. Just driven out to get some food. And I'm like, Oh, do I really want to pay this much money to do this thing? And then, you know, like I had to do the thing I do all the time, which is to remind myself, snap out of it and be like, Hey, look, when are you going to be back here? I, you've never heard of a place that allows you to just fly a stunt plane without any training type of thing. Um, do it. So then, yeah, I emailed them back, came back and within, I think 30 minutes, 40 minutes of responding to that email. Like I was sitting in the cockpit of wow. um, this two person stunt plane. Yeah. And yeah, you get into that thing, you get like five minutes of training where the guy holds uh, a wooden airplane model and then he's like this is what we're gonna do we're gonna go up we're gonna dive down we're gonna spin to the left we're gonna spin to the right barrel rolls and figure eights and then we'll have a couple of surprises so he and then he shows me what effectively is supposed to be like a joystick but it's a stick and you push the stick forward if you want to dive you stick you pull the stick back and you want to kind of go up right left if you want to like roll the plane to the left and right if you want to roll the plane to the right and that was it right and then you get into the plane, he takes off and he tells you to watch out for other planes because he can't see anything from back there. Yeah. And then once you get into the air high enough, <laughs> then he's just like, all right, he, he shows that his hands are up in the air, you know, in the camera that's recording all of this. Um, <clears throat> and he tells you that you are in control. And then uh, it's just, you know, listening to his instructions to go left or right. And yeah, within again, 30 minutes from the time I sent the email, I was sitting in the cockpit and like 15 minutes from that point, I'm up in the air and I'm doing like a, you know, leftward barrel roll. Yeah. And, uh, it was insane. Probably the one thing that I recommend, uh, to everyone heading to New Zealand, if they happen to be driving through Abel Tasman. Well, and there's literally a picture on, on your site of you're upside down. You're looking toward the camera on the left wing. The pilot or the instructor is in the back with his hands sticking out of the po- cockpit showing he's not flying the airplane and you've <laughs> yeah. got this plane upside down. It, it's an absolutely incredible shot. What an experience. Yeah, it was so cool. I just uh, I attached my GoPro to the side of the wing. And then I, yeah, I just left it on uh, video and then I was able to pull that still out of that and it perfectly captured like just what a unique experience that was to you know be not only be flying a plane uh but to like just kind of be upside down and yeah like every time you kind of stable stabilize yourself based on the horizon sure you, know, you can see the horizon and then within like a second if you just kind of hold it to the left or right like the horizon just flips uh, it's not like a slow thing you see like when a, a commercial airline is kind of like turning it literally just flips and you're, you're upside down or you flip 45 degrees and then now it's at an angle yep and yeah yeah those stunt biplanes are moving quick you're right it's it's nothing like an airline <laughs> airplane for sure but what what an incredible opportunity and you know i i would say like for most of those listening in they're going to go to your your instagram feed and even again as i have it open in front of me right now i'm scrolling through and looking at these images and it looks like something from from national geographic uh, and consistently so i mean just and by the way your your photographic work is is beautiful but then to top that off the fact that you have the opportunity to capture so many different scenes from some, so many different places in the world is is just incredible and and most photographers or even just most people in general their tendency in this case would probably be to respond with well there's no way that i can first of all make enough money and then create the time and space and in, in my own life in order to live this way. So I'm curious to dig into that just a little bit. Help us understand a little bit about how, I mean, you're a professional photographer, videographer, and you're doing gigs in various places in the world, but how do you make time for this travel and then, and then simultaneously support yourself as a professional photographer and videographer? Yeah. I mean, simple answers, you know, I have gigs, they pay me. I use that money to travel. Um, time, you know, obviously, if I'm not pegged to a desk or a job that requires me to come in at the same time every week, 
then I can block out chunks of time to go from place to place. As far as the logistics of how to make all of this happen, the easiest answer to that is that traveling is not as expensive as people think. Hmm. You can travel and rack up a few thousand dollars in a few days quite easily. I know people who, you know, never, some friends who are from Los Angeles growing up and they rarely ever travel, but they use their money and, you know, blow it in a weekend in Vegas. And meanwhile, I'm thinking, well, you know, that $3,000 you blew it, you know, getting table service and nice hotel room and all that. I can take that and go traveling for probably two and a half months. Wow. You know, the most expensive part is really the airplane tickets. Sure. You know, and there's so many ways to get free plane tickets, you know, using airline miles and sort of credit card hacking tricks. It's all online and or just getting cool travel deals. You know, I just finished a three week European trip. Part of it was to go to Copenhagen to see my sister get married. And then I had a, a gig in Madrid as well. And I stopped by eight different countries during <laughs> the three weeks. Wow. Uh, I took, I think, one bus, one train. The rest of it were flights. Okay. And it cost me $800 for all those flights, including getting from Los Angeles to Europe and How back. How in the world? Wow. And there was really, the, the, there was no secret, no tricks to it. You know, it's just a matter of going on, looking at flights, finding destinations that kind of worked for where I was going okay. and uh, booking it at a reasonable price. And so once you get that out of the way, you know, traveling, there's so many ways to see the world and not have to to see it out of like an expensive hotel room. Right. You know, I was staying with friends that I've met over the course of, you know, 10 years and just kind of visiting and a lot of those places. Yeah, I stayed with them. But otherwise, you know, you can find Airbnb that are reasonable. I love staying in hostels even now just because it's the best way to meet people, right. especially if you're traveling alone and you get to do it at a fraction of a price of the price of a hotel room. And because it's such good business for, um, and the hostel owners know this, you know, they're constantly making it better. It's not like what people think of the hostels in, you know, the eighties, the nineties where, uh, it's just like a rickety bed in a, a dirty room and you're sharing like a bathroom with 30 people. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's kind of almost too easy now. You know, there's so many hostels that are like the equivalent of three, four star hotels, really just what you get for, you know, the 15, $20 you often pay a night is ridiculous. And so, yeah, there's so many ways to kind of save money when you travel that, for me personally, if I am not needed in San Francisco, it's cheaper for me to be traveling than it is to just sit in my room and twiddle my thumb. Wow. So, what, what a fascinating perspective. Wait, are there particular resources that you've referred to or looked to to help you learn this kind of inexpensive style of travel that maybe our listeners can tap into as well? I mean, a lot of this kind of I've just picked up over the years. Okay. But yeah, there, you know, you look at sites like I guess uh the Points Guy or Million Mile Secrets or something like that. Okay. These show you sort of how to do the credit card hacking. Yeah. Uh type of things where not credit card hacking, that sounds wrong. <laughs> um <laughs> the total le you, legal kind of credit card hacking. No, I totally yeah, know yeah, what you mean. You, yeah. You know, how you can apply for certain credit cards that give out fifty to hundred thousand airline miles. And, you know, they kind of show you how you can hit the minimum spend limits without having to actually spend, you know, the three to five thousand dollars to get those points uh, so that almost anybody can do it. Uh, and I know because, you know, I've suggested this to a lot of my friends. I've suggested this to people who weren't making a lot of money and uh, they were able to get some use out of it. I mean, your your miles will vary on how many credit cards you can get at a time. But I mean, I've since racked up at least 700,000 miles that I haven't used yet. That's amazing. Uh, just from this. And yeah, sites like that would be great. Obviously, I've been trying to write more about this on my own site, Wear and Wander, just to, to kind of help people without 
you know, sort of all the the BS. Sure. You know, there's what, one of the things I say is like I do earn my money through photography and filmmaking, and not necessarily trying to sell like you know a specific program on how to travel, for example. Oh, sure, yeah. And so for me, you know, I want to give out this information and resource without sort of all the the extra clutter. And you know, I had an article recently on just how to find cheap flights and like first thing I say in there is there's no secrets. You know, it's just there are people out there who are searching for cheap flights every day and they'll send it out so you can tap into that resource or you can just look at sites like Skyscanner and Kayak and you know play around with your different options. I'm trying to find some cheap flights for my brother right now to to get to Europe and kind of to go around. And the biggest thing in there is flexibility. Okay. You know, I was telling him like, where are your in and out dates? Where do you want to be? Where do you need to be? And the more rigid that schedule is, the more you're kind of subjected to whatever the pricing happens to be. Interesting. You know, right now it's summer, it's going to be expensive. And if he wants to, let's say, fly into London, fly out of Budapest, then there's only so much you can do. It's going to cost so much. But if he's a little bit flexible on dates, for example, he might want to fly out on a Tuesday or a Wednesday or a Saturday, which are days that I find to be the cheapest, and maybe hop over to fly out of Prague or Vienna, or even just hop back to London and fly out of London. And so when you play around with these options, which requires a little bit of time and research, you can get some pretty good deals, you know, so flexibility helps a lot. <laughs> That's incredible. Well, I really can't thank you enough for making these recommendations. We'll certainly link to the resources that you mentioned as well in the show notes for our listeners. I do have one other question though. I mean, you, you emphasize the fact that you are making money as a professional photographer and videographer and that funds these trips, but are the, I guess a, a question that a lot of our listeners will probably have is how do we get those international gigs? Because photographers are having a hard enough time in many cases getting a gig across town, much less in Barcelona or in London or otherwise. Have you taken a certain approach to business that's enabled you to get many more international gigs? Um, yeah, I guess, you know, I think visibility is the most important part. No one's going to hire you in London or Madrid if they don't know you exist. Hmm. The second thing is, uh, is there a value proposition in bringing in somebody from San Francisco instead of just hiring local? So you kind of have to tackle those two problems. The first one with visibility, for me, it's about doing cool things, you know, writing about cool places, filming personal projects on my own that people would enjoy watching. And if that happens to be shared and more and more people get to see it, like, you know, one of my time-lapse video, when it first came out, it was one of the first videos I created and it went viral. So with yeah, when you say people, viral, I, I was just looking at this today. We're talking over 4 million hits at this point on YouTube. We'll make sure to link to that in the, in the show notes. But yeah, amazing. Thank you. And, you know, with that, right, you have that many more eyes on your product and the, the, the sad truth is like, you know, there's so many talented people everywhere. Yeah. But when it comes time to hiring somebody, the hardest part is the research cost. You know, there's so many photographers out there, so many video videographers. Where do you start? You know, if you were a production manager, a company or like an owner and you're like, I want a video for my company. Uh, do you start with Google? You know, do you just Google in, you know, like, uh, Madrid videographer or I mean that's generally what people do the other is just to kind of go with what you know or if someone happens to pop on the radar and with Instagram with Facebook this happens often you you just see random people popping up and you're like well that person is doing something cool or oh wow he's talented and the thing is like that person may not even be the best person and for you know there's so many people out there that it's more likely than not that that's not the best person, but it's a person. And now you know hmm. that here's somebody who's capable of doing something that you need. Yeah. And so it's a matter of reaching out and saying, okay, hey, can we make this happen? Whether it's a price thing, a time thing, a location thing. And yeah, so my approach is to, you know, when I can, I, I fund my own projects to go to the places I want to go and shoot the things I want to shoot. Uh, and make the videos that I want to shoot or the videos that clients might want to see and try to get it seen. 
you know, like that, that part, I can't really help you on. It's, I'm still figuring it out. It's hard enough to, to kind of get viewers and followers as you know, everyone knows. But, but there's a certain amount of, I mean, the consistency in which if even just looking at your Instagram account and the consistency in the content that you're creating is pretty incredible. So when you're talking about, you mentioned two really interesting points. One was visibility. You're, you're consistently and constantly creating content that may be interesting to a potential client. So there's the visibility, the value prop. I'm, I'm curious, are you, are you kind of minimizing the cost to the potential client for travel because you're going to travel anyway? Or what, how do you bring a value proposition, as you said, for somebody who's in Barcelona or in Spain or otherwise, um, to hire somebody from San Fran? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when it comes to value, you know, there's, if you're looking at a big company, right, chances are they've got the budget to fly you out there. So if you're lucky enough to work with a bigger company, then that's not a problem. When you're working with companies that are sort of right on the edge of that decision-making process, then uh, yeah, it does help. Like for example, with my recent client in Madrid, they knew they found out that I was coming to Europe, and so they reached out and said, "Hey, if wherever you are in Europe, if we flew to flew you to Madrid, put you up, you know, and then paid you for this project, can you do it?" And so we worked back and forth, and you know, in that case it was like, okay, well, do I need to shift my schedule around? Do I need to change my, my flights around? Is it going to cost me anything? So I I do try to minimize the cost to my clients when possible. Cause I think things like travel costs, it it doesn't benefit anybody. It just, you know, I'm not getting paid more and they're just, they have to pay more. So however I can minimize that part to make it work for everybody, uh, it helps a lot. And then, yeah, it's sort of kind of meeting them halfway if possible. Sure. But the other, you know, when I say value proposition, I also mean, you know, do you bring something different to the table? Because like I said, there are tons of talented photographers and videographers. And in my case, I personally believe that it's sort of about concepting and storytelling. Hmm. So um, they've tried a couple of uh, different videographers to try to make a video for their project and they weren't happy with it. And so, you know, in terms of like, we go back to the the first value, you know, my question to them was like, well, you spent less on these videographers and you've had to do it two times already. You can kind of continue that approach or find somebody that, you know, can get the job done. Wow. And, you know, then it became, it's on me to, to, to show them whether I can get the job done or not. Yeah. And luckily in this case, they've seen my work before and they've liked it. So yeah, we were able to, to make that work. And so while being able to see my sister get married, take my parents on a European trip, and then, you know, see a lot of my friends from previous trips, I was also able to kind of like squeeze four days in there to check out Madrid and to, to film. Incredible. Absolutely amazing. And again, this the story is extremely inspiring, but I love how matter of fact and practical you are about it. And again, we'll, we'll make sure to link our listeners to the resources that you mentioned thus far. Uh, and speaking of linking to resource, there's an article that, that first captured my attention. And the reason why I had you on in the first place, an article that you wrote for F-Stoppers about how you shot a wedding with just one 35 millimeter lens. And, and I mean, in a culture, especially in our photo industry, that's kind of obsessed with the latest and greatest technology and having any and every bit of it at your fingertips, um, the, the idea that somebody would shoot with just one lens is very fascinating to me. I'm also a bit of a minimalist, so it very much resonated with me. But how did this even happen to begin with? Uh, let me first off start by saying I love gear as well. I mean... I am a geek when it comes to it. Uh, But at the same time, you know, gear is only as good as what you shoot. You know, you can have the best cameras, but if you're shooting crappy things, it's still going to be a crappy photo. 100%, uh, yeah. Or a crappy subject, whatever it is. And so at the end of the day, it's just, you know, you get what you need to do the job that you're trying to do or to kind of fulfill what you want to do. So I love the latest and greatest. But at the same time, you know, when something works, it works. You know, and when something inspires you to do something better or more creatively, then kind of go with that. You know, for me, just tangent a bit, like I love 
shooting with film still from time to time. Yeah. Um, it's slow. It's cumbersome. You don't get all the features that are now available in digital cameras. You know, Sony cameras, which I use, have like amazing low light capabilities. So you're able to shoot almost in the dark and still get a very usable image. Right. You really can't do that on film. And, you know, when you're loading 35 millimeter film, you'll have 24 to 36 shots. So you really don't want to like kind of hold down a camera and get like a 20 shot burst mode and you're done. So you're sort of much more deliberate about it. And you're deliberate about choosing your aperture, choosing your shutter speed, making sure that the light is metered properly. And it really kind of takes you back to like the original process of photography and what you want to capture rather than just the, having this, this device that can capture everything. So yeah, jumping back to the, the wedding thing, it was not something that I planned to do. Uh, I showed up as I always do with like, you know, two to three lenses that cover the focal lengths that I need for the shoot. And I started with a 35 millimeter and this was a manual focus. It's actually a, a cine lens that I usually use for video. Um, but it captures amazing photos. And I started with that. And I mean, long story short, and I'll jump to all the stuff in between, but throughout the entire day, I just did not feel a pressing need to change the lens. It was working. It was working in the space I was shooting in. It was working with the light that I was using. Uh, it provided all the looks that I wanted. 35 as a focal length is sort of like right there at the beginning of wide uh, and just closing in on portrait. Yeah. So if you take a few steps closer, you could frame it to get what effectively would sort of be like the 50 millimeter look. Right. And if you take a step back, you can still get that wide look and get closer to 24. It's not the exact same thing. So I know people who are technical camera people will be like, no, it's not the same thing. <laughs> it is not, you know, you're not right. going to get the same compression. You're not going to get the same look, you know, like that's why I'll use sometimes like a 70 to 200 lens and shoot at 200 millimeters to do a portrait sure. because then I can compress the background. But here, you know, like I, I really was going for, I'm capturing the subject, you know, capturing the, 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 the couple. I'm capturing some of the details, the, the guests and the, the receptions, the cocktail and the ceremony. And it was just a matter of getting in closer when I needed to. And I wasn't constrained by that. You know, if I was shooting in a church where I couldn't go past a certain point and the bride and groom is like 20 feet away from me, this wouldn't have worked. I, you know, I'd be left with a bunch of really wide shots where the bride and groom is really tiny at the altar. But in this case, it was a very intimate space. So I can move up freely without getting in the way of people. And, you know, it just, it went back to that whole, you know, minimalist thing. You ha there was this one lens that worked for everything I needed. And because I didn't have to think about changing lenses, I didn't have to think about, okay, you know, when do I switch from this camera to this camera? I, folk, I was able to focus completely on the shooting. And that was what kind of kept me shooting with that one lens. Yeah, I, I like the point. Well, first of all, to, to your original point, I, I, I'm certainly on board with the idea that, that gear is fun. And I don't want to minimize that. I think what stood out in this case is that uh, you know, as, as easy it, as it can be to get carried away with gear. In fact, I've mentioned this before in the podcast. I'd, uh, a big reason why I even got into photography in the first place as a wedding photographer um, was because of the gear. I mean, I was so stoked to be able to pick up a, a camera that could shoot uh, so quickly and, and respond, you know, focus so quickly. Uh, it's fun to play with the gear, especially the latest stuff. The Sony cameras in particular are so quick. And as you say, they can shoot in practically in, in the dark. Uh, but the fact that you have just you're using just one lens, as you pointed out, kind of fo forces you to shoot almost in a different way, and and I like that. I, I love shooting with my film camera as well. I've got a couple of them, but one in particular, a medium format camera that also forces me to to shoot in a different way. Everything is manual. It's medium format. It's going to be slow. Likely, I'm going to even put it on a tripod, and so it forces not only a different perspective but a different approach. And I, I like the raw experience. 
experience that comes from being forced to use a particular kind of equipment that limits me, but in a sense then almost maxes, maximizes the amount of creativity because it forces you to think different. So I, I, I love your perspective on that. The, the big question that I have is how you, I mean, I'm looking through these images and the article that was posted to, to Petapixel in this case, and, and I, was, I was noticing that the images, you wouldn't have guessed just by looking at the wide variety of the images that they were only shot with one lens. It is, as you're saying, verging on wide angle. It was just a matter then of moving in close, stepping in close and stepping back. And did that did that make the clients nervous at all that you had to step in closer to them versus you know shooting with a 70 to 200 and being able to stay out of their space? Uh, no. <laughs> Short answer was no, they weren't. They never felt like restricted or claustrophobic by the fact that I was constantly close to them. And I think a a large part of that has to do with how you interact with your clients. And for me, that's a a huge, like probably the biggest part about what allows me to do what I do when I shoot weddings is interacting with them, getting to know them before the day. And by the time I show up, I'm not just a vendor that is like, hey, I'm your photographer, by the way, let's get shooting. I want them to be comfortable with me. And if we haven't had a chance to develop that rapport prior to the wedding, then it's about taking that the time in the first hour, getting them used to what I do. You know, when I'm shooting the getting ready, I'm going up, I'm being playful with the fact that I am coming up close. And, you know, you might get a an initial like, whoa, not too close. You know, like pe- that's people's natural reactions. Like, ah, you know, they think that it's going to focus in on all their blemishes and whatnot. Right. And if you can play that off, and make them feel comfortable then as the day goes along people forget that the camera is even there you know you you want to get to that point where first the client forgets it and then all the guests forget it whether you know i'm moving around during the ceremony or kind of pointing a camera into people's face or even hiding behind another person and kind of shooting using that person's uh, frame as like a, a foreground blur element uh, you want people to be comfortable with that. You know, you don't want to be the guy who looks like he's creeping in the corner, snapping a shot <laughs> of you, drinking, yeah. you know, having your gin and tonic. So, yeah, that's a huge part of that. And then being able to kind of do this effortlessly makes it easy for everybody. Yeah, the, the significance of the relationship, it really does make all the difference in the world. I, I don't know if, if this is the case for you. I spent quite a bit of time with clients, what I would say with most clients, photographing engagement sessions. So by the time I got to the wedding day, there was a certain comfort level. They knew what it was like to be in front of the camera. They knew how I would photograph. They knew um, when I would ask them to do one thing or another, what that actually meant. And it made the wedding day photographs go more smoothly. Do you have the opportunity to do engagement sessions very often? Or in this case, is it usually just the wedding? Uh, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, you have a chance to work with the client before it always helps. So when the clients do want the engagement sessions, it's a great way for us to kind of get that out of the way. But even when they don't, you know, I tell them, hey, you know, people have said in the past, you should get an engagement session. So you've got a chance to work with your photographer. And actually, that's not bad advice. You know, if you kind of see a certain work on the portfolio and then you shoot with the photographer turns out you really don't like their work or you're not comfortable with them then you have the chance to kind of like maybe find another photographer uh for the big day but yeah i mean for me even in the sort of consultation period i want to kind of not hide anything i want to put it all on the table yeah we want we want to set expectations you know i i ask them why they they want me as their photographer and I want a good answer. You know, you would think that you'd want to try to sell a client and really just get them on board as soon as possible. But for me, I actually tell them, you know, have you looked at other photographers? If you haven't, then I suggest you talk to a few more, you know, go through the process, take the time. I know it's like an extra hour or two or whatever research, but do it and then be sure that you know why you're going with a photographer because it's an important day. And I treat it as such. You know, and I, I kind of want them to kind of want me there because then we're embarking on this sort of project together. We're collaborating rather than, oh, I just need a photographer and you fit the bill. For sure. I think you it's sort of like you're you're never going to win in that situation. You know, if you do great, then it's par for the course. And if you happen to like, you know, they have something else in mind and you didn't talk about it 
then now they'll just have something to nitpick about. Whereas like if you're on the same page and they know why they want you, then they trust you to do what you do. And in this case, I mean, like no complaints at all. If they even noticed that I was shooting with just one lens and they just trusted me to kind of put them where they, I wanted to shoot them or to take them to this place or to say, okay, we've got the shots. You can go relax and have a drink. You know, I think having that trust, establishing that trust both ways is super important to any kind of gig, but especially so with weddings. It, it's huge. But I, I have to emphasize here something that you're, you're kind of pointing out, which is while the work is certainly important, they're going to want to be able to see a, a portfolio of images and be comfortable with you as a photographer and trust in you as a photographer because of the work they've seen. So much of it does rest on the relationship. And, you know, as, as much as I hear photographers say, I'm an introvert, it's so important to learn to develop social skills that enable you to develop relationships with your clients or potential clients very, very quickly. Part of that does require a little bit of vulnerability, but ultimately it can translate to much more uh, or much more effective photography on especially a wedding day when you got to move so so much more quickly that they can trust you and what you're doing the fact that maybe you only have one lens but you've, you've got to learn how to connect with those clients because ultimately it will translate to images that are much more emotionally vulnerable i mean you can see that in the images that that you photographed of of this couple this beautiful couple in this article. But just to, to close our conversation today, Ken, what are a few principles, and you've alluded to these, I think, a little bit in the conversation already, but are there a few principles that enabled you to photograph with just one lens that maybe our listeners who are curious to try something like this can apply to their photography as well? Uh, what were the principles that drove that? Yeah. Well, I mean, the first thing is like, you really have to respect the, the subject. And what I've like the one sort of intangible thing that I've learned over shooting this for years is, you know, it's not about how many shots you take, you know, with, we go back to gear and you can shoot 10 frames a second, 20 frames a second. You can just snap away and then go through and pull out that best shot. That's one way to do it. But you know that there were amazing photographers in the past who were able to do it, snapping one frame every minute, Yeah, you know, and Part of that is sort of like connecting with the subject, respecting it. When you can anticipate a moment, then you've sort of like kind of wiped away all the moments outside of that that don't matter. Mm. Then it's a, it's a matter of like using your skill and expertise to be able to snap at that right second amongst like three seconds versus looking at like the, you know, the subject across like an hour. You know, like, what are you looking to capture? You know, if you're much more deliberate about it and shooting with le one lens forces you to do that, especially like you're saying, with shooting with medium format, you're setting every setting and you might even have to put it on a tripod. And so it's going to take you time before that shot and then time afterwards to break down and then get to the next shot. So in this case, shooting with a manual focus lens, I know that I've got to be ready. I need to, I, I have to know how to use the lens. You know, it's not, um, yeah, just press down this button and, or turn this this way, you know, zoom in or autofocus. You have to know how to use your lens. And the more you do something like this, it's kind of a circle. You know, the more you do it, the more you get better at it, the more comfortable you are at it and the better you are at using that lens. And so, this wasn't the first time that I shot a lot with this lens. You know, when I travel, even though it's a bigger lens than I'd like to take with me, it's still a lens that I, I love using. And so I use it a lot and I'm comfortable with it. I know how to kind of dial in on that little bit of focus change. So even if people are moving fast, I kind of know how to anticipate when they might move right into the range that I'm focusing on or if they're not going to move into it, I know how I can move to where they are. And just kind of respecting that, being slow, anticipating, being deliberate about it, it's it's how you're able to, to kind of get the most out of your gear. So it doesn't matter if it's a, a zoom lens or a fixed lens. In this case, it was a 35 millimeter fixed lens. But, you know, most people can shoot an entire wedding with one lens easily, the 24 to 70 and uh, usually that's like sort of like the workhorse lens for most wedding photographers. 
because you go from wide to just over from 24 to 70 and you get wide and you get some a bit of telephoto and you should have all the range you need, but it does make it easier because, you know, you can stand in one place, zoom out, zoom in. In this case, you really have to move. And that means if, you know, a zoom that might take half a second might require like another second for you to step forward that many steps. And so you need to think about that. You need to anticipate that. And the beauty about it for me is that it really brings you into the moment a lot more. It gets you really thinking about the subject, what you're trying to capture, rather than just capturing and then hoping that you can crop out of it, you know, and crop your way into a shot or, you know, pick the best shot. So, yeah. Well, you know, I, I love the way that you summed this up. This is not uh, not something that I've heard from any of our guests on the podcast yet. When describing how to more effectively use gear, you're not necessarily starting with a technique as much as a concept or an idea, which is respect the subject. And that respect then translates to a, a very conscious effort, first of all, to know the gear, um, then to anticipate the moment, to be deliberate, and, and ultimately to truly be present uh, in that moment in order to be able to effectively use that gear. I, I, this is a really, really great perspective, a great way to look at uh, a situation like this. And I really appreciate you sharing your insight and your experience and your wisdom with us today, Ken. And ultimately, I mean, we, we started off this conversation with time. I truly appreciate you making time for all of us. Can you just in closing share with our listeners? I know we've mentioned a couple of times, but where can they find you online? How can they follow all of your adventures? Uh, yeah, so on Instagram, I'm at hello Kian. That's hello and K I E N. And my website is whereandwander.com. That's wander, as in I'm wandering this way, that way, as opposed to wonder. Um, and yeah, that's really kind of where I kind of share my thoughts on travels and how to travel and then some of the unique adventures I have in the bucket list. And of course, you know, I've got a YouTube channel and all that stuff. It's everything is, can be accessible from Instagram or the website, but I think, yeah, the website and Instagram are two great ways to kind of start with uh, what I do. It's, this is amazing. I mean, truly I've been inspired today, even just the amount of time that I've spent on, on those various sites that you just mentioned. Um, I truly appreciate you making time for the book of podcast listeners with sharing with all of this. This has been wonderfully encouraging, inspiring, and uh, I'm, I'm motivated certainly to get out and do more. Thank you so much for your time. No, thank you so much. Thanks so much for listening to the Boca podcast today. Will you let us know what you think by leaving a review of the podcast in iTunes or maybe in the Apple podcast app? And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast, maybe suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My direct email is nathan at photographersedit.com. The Boca Podcast is brought to you by Photographers Edit, custom image editing for the wedding and portrait photographer. Just visit photographersedit.com. Thank you.